I love this time of year at St. Paul because our campus hustles and bustles with activity like no other time of the year except maybe Holy Week and right before Christmas. Children flood our hallways, source groups are being launched, basketball and volleyball activities continue. A week ago, we had a very special event here that was hosted by our Handy Capable Ministry that allowed those who deal with respite care and people who spend lots of their time providing care to others to find new and best ways of doing things. We were a host site for that. It was a great job. Thank you, Horton, for, for handling that. Um, some of our seasonal events are happy and joyful. But on other times, many of you step forward to serve our members who are saying goodbye to loved ones. In the last two weeks alone, we have had memorial services um, to comfort the families of three gentlemen in our congregation who've gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, the, the ministry that this church extends to those families is a beautiful thing indeed. Um, and, and so it's, it's a great time to be at St. Paul, even in the times that involve grief and sorrow and comforting those who feel sorrows. These ministries that we do in our community and in our church, they tug on this deacon's heart. A deacon's ministry by our book of discipline is to connect the worshiping body of the church to the needs of the world and to help that worshiping body, that's you and me together, invite those in the world who have needs and who don't know Jesus Christ to come back and join us in this place. And so as we have Vacation Bible School and the Jubilee and Summer Camp, as we welcome families who are mourning lost loved ones, as we launch new source groups that include people who are not part of our congregation, we are fulfilling that ministry that is so near and dear to my heart, and for that I thank you. Felix read you this morning our text. It's about giving comfort, and it isn't very long, so I want to read it again for you. But this time I ask you to pay attention and hear how many times the word comfort comes to us in this text. This is from 2 Corinthians, the first book, the first chapter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. And that's where our focus is today. Let me repeat that verse. So that we comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. From God. We are not only to be comfort receivers, we are to be comfort givers. I am fortunate to be the pastor for our Stephen ministry here at St. Paul, and I will tell you the men and women who serve in that ministry go above and beyond in providing comfort and service to others. They do an amazing amount of pouring of themselves into another soul that is hurting, grieving, lost, and in need of attention. And it isn't a one-time thing. Our Stephen ministers go through an extended time of training once a week for many, many weeks to learn about Stephen ministry. That's why we commission them here before the whole congregation. They make a commitment to attend meetings on two Monday nights a week. Some of them go on to assume roles of leadership. It is a long-term commitment, but what they do for this congregation and for some people outside the congregation makes the pastoral work of St. Paul possible. There is no way with a congregation that our side that your two pastors could possibly visit everybody, see everybody, counsel everybody, and love on everybody who's sick, who's hurting, or who's homebound. Horton Towns, Lois Hansen, they do amazing jobs of going out and visiting, and we thank them and bless them every day. And I promise you, nobody blesses them more than Pastor Bob and I, because it, it could be a full-time job. And so to the Stephen ministers 
who do such important work in our congregation, I thank you. And I want to ask you all today, those of you who, have, who believe that you have gifts of giving comfort and loving and healing, I'd really like you to pray about becoming part of our Stephen ministry. We never have enough. But it's a ministry that requires a long-term commitment. It requires discernment and prayer. And so I ask you today to please pray about that. You know, there's a scripture in our Bible that reminds me an awful lot of the work that Stephen Ministries does, but it's really the other way around, because the scripture is about Jesus when he healed the man with leprosy. It, we find it in Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 44, and I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said. Be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. There's some lessons in that scripture for us, and I think that our Stephen ministers embody that scripture as they go about their day-to-day -day duties in their ministries. They respond to people because they are willing. They respond to people with compassion. Jesus didn't hold the leper at arm's length, and in those days, keeping a leper at arm's length was not only customary, it was the law. When someone came near a leper, the law required the leper to say, unclean, unclean, so the people would know to stay away and not touch them so they wouldn't transmit that disease. Jesus wasn't concerned about that law. The scripture tells us he touched the man and he was healed. His ministry was done face to face, up close and personal, and too often we're comfortable to contribute to ministry in ways that allow us to remain a little bit removed from those who need our comfort. It's always wonderful to receive a card and a note, the cards and notes that you flooded me with a couple months ago, I will keep forever. But getting up close and personal with someone who's really hurting, it takes tenderness and compassion, and it also takes courage. And our Stephen ministers exemplify that here in our congregation. But there are others who give comfort in our congregation as well. I've already mentioned a couple of people who go out and do lots of visiting to our hospital folks. We try in this congregation, that we, we try as a staff and a leadership team to go pray with folks who are going into surgery. I look around this room and I see people who I've prayed with and I see people who I know Horton's prayed with and Pastor Bob's prayed with prior to surgeries and others. That's important and it gives comfort to folks. I see people in this room who are part of our Martha ministry who prepare meal after meal after meal to be delivered to some folks who are having trouble cooking their own meals because of age, illness, or infirmity. And they do this out of the goodness and graciousness of their hearts. Our Loving Hearts ministry who provide refreshments and hospitality after funeral services and memorial service have been working overtime in the last couple of months. I experienced their love personally as well as the love of many of you who joined in with them a couple months ago. And in the last three weeks, there were two receptions right here for families who were mourning lost loved ones. And the ministry that is done in those receptions is a ministry of comfort. I look around the room and I see people who knit. They make prayer shawls. They make little pot holders that have messages on them of love, from Christ and from this church. All of those things involve giving comfort to people inside and outside of our congregation. But sometimes we limit our understanding of caregiving to the healing ministries, the grieving ministries, and the feeding ministries. We feed tons of people over at Open Arms all the time. We feed homeless people every Sunday. But the fact is giving comfort also involves other kinds of initiatives. 
Our strategic initiatives, which some of you are getting tired of hearing about, they're about giving comfort. When we go find 20,000 people within a five-mile radius of St. Paul who don't know Jesus and share the love of Christ with, him, with them, we are giving spiritual comfort to those who don't know the Lord. We are giving relational comfort to people who are invited in to become part of a church family. And it is a family. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. I know better. We are a family, the Lord's family, in the body of Christ. And when we reach those 20,000, we are giving relational and spiritual comfort to people who desperately need it. When we follow Jesus' lead to advocate for those who live in poverty, to give a helping hand to those who don't have enough to eat, who can't afford to buy school supplies or backpacks for their kids. We are giving physical comfort, food, economic opportunity, vocational opportunity, educational opportunity. When we help a child be prepared for school, we are enhancing their educational opportunities. Make no mistake about it. You heard me say this last week. I'm going to beat this subject like a drum. There are kids, and when we help them, we are raising them up to overcome the circumstances that they didn't choose for their lives. When we alleviate poverty, when we advocate for those who have no voice, we are also offering spiritual and relational comfort. Now, many of you have been asking, come on, Pastor Pam, come on, Pastor Bob, how are we going to reach 20,000 people? How are we going to do that? And it reminds me of a conversation I had a few years ago with some of my staff at the property appraiser's office. One of the offices had fallen behind in the property inspections they were supposed to do. We have to do a certain number every year to meet the state law requirements. And they were 70,000 inspections behind because we had had huge staff cuts. I mean, there's 450,000 properties in Pinellas County. They were saying, oh, no, how are we going to get caught up? And their manager put a big picture of an elephant on the wall, and as they did the inspections, they colored in the elephant, and he kept telling them, we're going to eat this elephant one bite at a time. And friends, we're going to reach the 20,000, one soul, one person, one need at a time. And if we do this, if we all do this together, what's going to happen? It's going to kind of be like when your interest compounds in your savings account. When we reach that person out there in the community and share the love of Christ with them, we're counting on them to pass it on. That's how we reach the 20,000. But we really need an attention getter. We need something that's visible. We need a consistent way to show our love in the community and to share our love with those in need. The church too often, I don't mean this church, but I mean some churches who profess to be Christians are known more for what they're against than for what they're in favor of. Who always steals the limelight on TV? The church that goes and pickets at a military funeral. The church that goes and pickets in front of a mosque or a synagogue, the church that denigrates people in our community because of their color. And I'm calling them a church only because they call themselves a church. And in my heart, and if this comes across as political, I'm sorry, but this is who I am. That is not the church of Jesus Christ. That is not the church that Christ called us to be. That is not the church he commissioned to make disciples and to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But too often, who do the media highlight when it comes to highlighting Christianity? It's those people who profess to love Jesus and who don't behave like Jesus at all who grab the limelight. And so we need to grab the limelight for our community. I don't mean by holding a big parade. I don't mean by pounding our chest 
and seeking acclaim for ourselves, but we want to be a church that's known for what we're for. We're for Jesus and sharing his love. We're for our community. We're for our missionary, Carolyn Goodwin, who's serving in Africa. Recently, our church council met and approved a campaign that will help us tell our community. This isn't another strategic initiative. This is the how. This is one of the how we will achieve the strategic initiatives for those of you who ask. This is what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask you to tell the community what you're for. We're going to ask you to be observant and to notice when someone in the community does a wonderful job of serving you as a customer. When you see someone in the community do a random act of kindness, when you see someone in the community at a hospital, a nurse, a doctor, when you see them do something that is loving and caring and kind, we have some cards. They're in the pews in front of you. They look like this. They say, for Pinellas on them. And what it says on the card is, many times all you know about a church is what it is against. St. Paul United Methodist Church wants you to know that we are for our neighbors, for our community, for you, for Pinellas. It's not a gimmick. It's not a commercial. It's not a marketing scheme. It's a way to let people know what we're about and why we're about what we're about. We're asking you to be observant, to notice acts of compassion. We're going to ask you to grab a t-shirt, and we're going to ask you to make a donation for that t-shirt of $5, please. And if I can do this... This is awkward. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, for Pinellas. But this isn't a pastor thing. This is your lay leader. He's for Pinellas too. Would you put that over there? Thanks. We want you to be for Pinellas. The t-shirts are available. Friends, for us to reach the 20,000, it's time to get going. We have some ways to do that now. The t-shirts are one of them. Why, the, why doesn't it say St. Paul on it anywhere? Because we want people to ask you. We want them to say, why are you wearing that thing? What does that mean? For Pinellas? Who's for Pinellas? Why are you for Pinellas? What group are you? What is this about? And then, when you explain it to them, hopefully some of them will ask you that jackpot question that we all need to long to hear as Christians. Why are you doing this? And then we answer, we're for Pinellas because Jesus is for us. Jesus loved us first, and so we're going to share that love with you. We're for you, for your neighbor, for your family, for the community where you live. We don't have the name of the church on the t-shirt because we want it to be mysterious, so they ask. And you just heard the answer. We need to give a consistent message. For those of you who are into social media, who use Twitter and who tweet and who Instagram and who Facebook and all that, when you see a random act of kindness or you see something good happen in the community, we want you to send an email to the church. Or if you use those social media things, we want you to describe them and acknowledge the good thing that you saw, and then after it, put hashtag, that means pound sign for those in my generation, pound sign for Pinellas. And if it's associated with St. Paul on the social media, and if we recognize the good things that we see, then people will understand what this church that follows Jesus Christ is for, not what other Christians, people who call themselves Christians, are against. I have a call to action for you. This summer, we're having vacation Bible school just a few weeks away. 
It will take place July 24th to 28th in the evening in the Christian Life Enrichment Center. It is a family VBS. We are inviting families. We are going to invite the families who bring their children to the Jubilee. Some of the ones with younger kids participated the last couple of years. We're going to have a meal. We're going to have worship time. We're going to have fun and game time. There's going to be time for lessons. But we need volunteers. Just a little after that, on August 5th, we're going to have the Back to School Jubilee. We're going to invite 400 kids to come here to this campus to get backpacks, shoe vouchers, clothing, and school supplies. We need volunteers. And you're always great at turning out for that. The last couple of years, we've had 100 volunteers at that event, and the people who were there had a pretty good time. This year, we're not going to have it extend as long into the day. We're going to have our guests come between 10 and 12. That's plenty of time to distribute this stuff, so it won't take your whole day. But we'd like for you to volunteer. We need donors. Financial contributions are what we use to buy the clothing. It's what we use to pay for the shoe vouchers. It takes $8,000 to buy 400 pairs of shoes. Take a 15% discount off that because we get so many vouchers. And you've always supported that endeavor. It takes volunteers through the summer on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings to sort and count and prepare the supplies to be stuffed. And I have a volunteer who has said if other people will join her in the evening, she'd like to have some working people take part in preparing for the Jubilee. So if you're interested in that, you need to let us know. And that wasn't on your Connect card today because I didn't already make this announcement and give this sermon, but it will be next week. Out on the, in the patio area after this service, there are tables where you can sign up to help with Vacation Bible School and the Back to School Jubilee. If you want to do one of the, be part of an evening group that meets once a week, you can sign up out there. You can also get your Four Pinellas t-shirt out there. And I know some of you will say, I don't wear t-shirts. Can't we get a nicer style shirt that's in a more girly color? Yes, we can. But we wanted to have something to start with today. So the t-shirts are out there. We're asking for a $5 donation. But I also have a call to action for those of you who have arts and skill, arts and craft skills. We're still, we're making toys. We're painting toys. And we're going to mentor some kids and ask them to help us pay toys over in the carpenter shop with our toy making ministry. When we present those first toys to the Largo Police and Fire Department, in my mind's eye, I want to see that be at the Largo Commission Chamber with a bunch of toys and a bunch of you wearing these shirts where we can present those and let the Largo City Commission, the Largo Policemen, and the Largo Firemen know we are for Largo. We are for our policemen. We are for our firemen. We are for the children they come in contact with who have had traumas, who's, have their, who's had their homes burned down. There's a reason we're making these toys, and it's going to give us an opportunity. So this is a call for us to act and not talk about it anymore. But we also have a call to action for this fall. This fall, one afternoon, evening a week, we are going to have our bus go to Largo Middle School, and we are going to bring middle school students who are struggling in school back here to St. Paul. We are going to invite high school students who are successful, perhaps earning bright future scholarships, who need community service hours, to volunteer to be one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two tutors with these middle schoolers. We need adults who are willing to supervise those pairs of high school and middle school mentor and mentee, tutor and student. We need adults who will be willing to cook a meal for them, to lead them in some recreation activities, to guide them as they paint some toys. This is a middle school ministry that's going to launch this fall, but we're planning for it now. And we need students, high school students, and adults, both, to make that successful. But you know, I also have a call on my heart to remember that all the people we're serving aren't kids. There's lots of people in our community who have trouble getting to church. They might be homebound. They might be unable to drive anymore. They might just have difficulty getting out and about. We have assisted living facilities. 
We have active manufactured home communities where lots of people who are believers live, but they don't come to church. I heard from a resident of Palm Hill Country Club when she had surgery. She said, I couldn't believe all the people who said they were praying for me because they never go to church. Well, you know what? Maybe we can take church to them. Maybe on a Wednesday afternoon, we can go there and provide a Bible study, a hymn sing, a brief message. We have to take church outside the walls. We have to go to where people are. Our United Methodist Church is recognizing those kinds of ministries and worship services that take place outside the walls as a fresh expression. And our carpenter shop, toy making ministry, has been recognized as one of the 82 fresh expressions here in the Florida Conference because there's member, there are people coming to participate in that who are not members of this church and because we are going to reach out to the community with worship and love. Every time those folks meet over there, they pray, they do prayer requests for each other, and they have a time of fellowship. It's not all toy making. It's summer at St. Paul. It's not just the hot and sleepy season. It's definitely hot. It's not supposed to be sleepy. We're called to be comfort givers. We're called to give the comfort that comes from the gospel message. That we receive our salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because we believe. We need to share that message. It's really good news and there's not much of it out there nowadays. We're called to give the comfort of letting people know they're not alone. We're called to give the comfort that comes from knowing there's a place where you're welcome as you are. Felix told me about a church he saw they had on the marquee, come as you are, our leader wore flip-flops. He wasn't talking about the pastor of the church. Have you ever seen Jesus' feet? We give comfort by letting our community know that we're for you, for the community, for the kids, for the homebound, for the seniors, for the families, for the homeless, for the hungry, for Pinellas. In Philippians chapter 2, there's a passage that I want to read to you, and I chose reading it from the message translation because I think it packs a powerful punch. Hear these words, friends. Hear these words. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to give a helping hand. Most of us have been in the church for a while. Sometimes we get comfortable. But we're not called to be comfortable we're called to give comfort. We're called to value others above ourselves, to be like-minded in tenderness and compassion, to not fight about the little stuff, but to love over all the things that we agree about. If we do this together, we will reach 20,000 people. We will become voices for people who live in poverty. Our community will know we are for them. Our kids will, will know they are our kids. We will provoke people to ask, why are you doing this? And our answer will be, because Jesus loved us first, and it's our job to pass it on. What are you going to do? Are you going to be comfortable? Or are you going to be a comfort giver? It's time to answer that question.